Good evening, everyone. Time for another Bitcoin report. This is Mt. Gox, the daily view. And you can see that we have a sort of a bullish formation here. We're going to look more closely at the technicals when we get over to Bitcoin wisdom. As far as market depth, we've got about 26,000 on the offer. You can see that key price of 10,000 is around 950. On the bid, it's about 650. And down to, say, 500 price, we have 40,000 or so, 35,000 or so bid. So, somewhat bearish on the bid and ask, but let's go over and look at the technicals at Bitcoin Wisdom. Now, this is the four hour. Let's move out to the six hour here. And you can see that we're trying to form up a this would be kind of a cup and saucer formation could turn it into a pennant formation but it's challenging the main area of resistance overhead it's going to be this section here this this huge M top here is not anywhere in view the only thing we're looking at here as far as overhead selling volume is going to be the selling that came in right about here so I expect a difficult test of this. Now, if we do get a decisive breakout to the upside, then all bets are off, and it would be kind of off to the races on a, a roll into new highs. But if you look at the rolling over sort of thing that we're getting here, let's get out to the four hour. We are getting a sort of rolling over weakening. If you look at the volume, you can see that since the bottom that we put in at 455, there hasn't been much volume except for this volume buy spike and this volume sell spike. So other than that, there's just been a lot of very small buys. So we're waiting for a resolution of this. It, it Right now, it looks like it could go either way. If we round off and start to fall, then we may actually see a retest of the lows. But uh, right now, I'm torn. You can see that this pattern here on the weekly chart does not have the typical crash pattern that you see when you have a spike top and then that's the end of the bull market. Normally when you get that, even on this one, you get just a continuous downward movement in prices after that spike top has been reached. We're not really seeing that. We're seeing this kind of rally at about the two-thirds correction level or so. So I'm still not convinced that we've put a top in here. I think that just by looking at this formation, there's going to be some testing of this. And if it's very strong, I think the move's going to be very rapid. The low, on the other hand, is going to be this 266 top. That is always a possibility. And a test back to there would actually be a normal correction for this type of bull market. This is a bull market that moves in many multiples of the old price and then corrects anywhere from 70 to 80 to 90 percent. We've seen that multiple times in this market. It wouldn't be surprising for us to see that again. That would be a tremendous buying opportunity for people who would like to pick up Bitcoins if they could pick them up for under $300. Now let's get to the main story. This is going to be long and boring for people who aren't into economic and political theory so let me warn you right now if you're not into that stuff just go ahead and tune out I'm gonna to try to talk a little bit about the controversy surrounding the the opposition that we see from the von Mises school now we would expect that most libertarians a lot of people have pointed out that for them acceptance of Bitcoin is kind of like a true test of libertarians and uh, if you don't accept Bitcoin then you're not really libertarian I'm not willing to say that but I do think that ultimately the objection of the we'll call them the von Mises school or the Austrians uh, they're the gold bugs 
I really think that their objections really don't have a lot of weight but we're gonna go fairly into depth into this and that is this regression theory and ultimately I think it's just a big waste of time and I'll explain to you why that's the case but let's jump into this with Menger and trying to account for the origin of money the Austrian school has offered the most comprehensive explanation of the historical origin of money now again keep this in mind they've offered the most comprehensive theoretical explanation they haven't offered a historical explanation and I think ultimately historical is the more valid but let's look at the theory here everyone recognizes the benefits of a universally accepted medium of exchange but how could such a money come into existence after all self-interested individuals would be very reluctant to surrender real goods and services in exchange for intrinsically worthless pieces of paper or even relatively useless metal discs it's true once everyone else accepts money in exchange then an individual is also willing to do so but how could human beings reach such a position in the first place one possible explanation is that a powerful ruler realized either on his own or through wise counselors that instituting money would benefit his people so he then ordered everyone to accept some particular thing as money there are several problems with this theory first as Menger pointed out we have no historical record of such an important event even though money was used in all ancient civilizations second there's the unlikelihood that someone could have invented the idea of money without ever experiencing it and third even if we did stipulate that a ruler could have discovered the idea of money while living in a state of barter it would not be sufficient for him to simply designate the money good he would also have to specify the precise exchange ratios between the newly defined money and all other goods otherwise the people under his rule could evade his order to use the newfangled money by charging ridiculously high prices in terms of that good Menger's theory avoids all of these difficulties according to Menger money emerged spontaneously through self-interested actions of individuals no single person sat back and conceived of a universal medium of exchange and no government compulsion was necessary to affect the transition from a condition of barter to a money economy in order to understand how this could have occurred Menger pointed out that even in a state of barter goods would have different degrees of saleability or saleableness closely related terms would be marketability or liquidity the more saleable a good the more easily its owner could exchange it for other goods at an economic price for example someone selling wheat is in a much stronger position than someone selling astronomical instruments the former commodity is more saleable than the latter notice that Menger is not claiming that the owner of a telescope will be unable to sell it if the seller sets his asking price in terms of other goods low enough someone will buy it the point is that the seller of a telescope will only be able to receive its true economic price if he devotes a long time to searching for buyers the seller of wheat in contrast would not have to look very hard to find the best deal that he is likely to get for his wares already we've left the world of standard microeconomics in typical models we can determine the equilibrium relative prices for various real goods for example we might find that one telescope trades against 1000 units of wheat but Menger's insight is that this fact does not really mean that someone going to market with a telescope can instantly walk away with 1000 units of wheat so let's go down and uh, jump to von Mises even though Menger had provided a satisfactory account for the origin of money this process explanation alone was not a true economic theory of money after all to explain the exchange value of cows economists don't provide a story of the origin of cows it took Ludwig von Mises in his 1912 the theory of money and credit to provide a coherent explanation of the pricing of money units in terms of standard subjectivist value theory in contrast to Mises approach which as we shall see was characteristically based on the individual and his subjective valuations most economists at that time clung to two separate theories on the one hand relative prices were explained using tools of marginal utility analysis 
But then, in order to explain the nominal money prices of goods, economists resorted to some version of the quantity theory relying on aggregate variables, and in particular the equation mv equals pq. Economists were certainly aware of this awkward position, but many felt that a marginal utility explanation of money demand would simply be a circular argument. We need to explain why money has a certain exchange value on the market. It won't do, so these economists thought, to merely explain this by saying that people have a marginal utility for money because of its purchasing power. After all, that's what we're trying to explain in the first place. Why can't people buy things? Why can people buy things with money? Mises eluded this apparent circularity by his regression theorem. Now this is going to be the big criticism of Bitcoin that it doesn't meet the regression theorem. In the first place, yes, people trade away real goods for units of money because they have a higher marginal utility for the money units than for the other commodities given away. It's also true that the economist cannot stop there. He must explain why people have a marginal utility for money. This is not the case for other goods. The economist explains the exchange value for Picasso by saying that the buyer derives utility from the painting and at that point the explanation stops. People value units of money because of their expected purchasing power. Money will allow people to receive real goods and services in the future and hence people are willing to give up real goods and services now in order to attain cash balances. Thus the expected future purchasing power of money explains its current purchasing power. But haven't we just run into the same problem of an alleged circularity? Aren't we merely explaining the purchasing power of money by reference to the purchasing power of money? No, Mises pointed out, because of the time element. People today expect money to have a certain purchasing power tomorrow because of their memory of its purchasing power yesterday. We then push the problem back one step. People yesterday anticipated today's purchasing power because they remembered that money could be exchanged for other goods and services two days ago, and so on. So far, Mises' explanation still seems dubious. It appears to involve an infinite regress. But this is not the case because of Menger's explanation of the origin of money. We can trace the purchasing power of money back through time until we reach the point at which people first emerged from a state of barter. And at that point, the purchasing power of money commodity can be explained in just the same way that the exchange value of any commodity is explained. People valued gold for its own sake before it became money, and thus a satisfactory theory of current market value of gold must trace back its developments until the point when gold was not a medium of exchange. The two great Austrian theorists, Karl Menger and Luke Ludwig von Mises provided explanations for both the historical origin of money and its market's price. Their explanations were characteristically Austrian in that they respected the principles of methodological individualism and subjectivism. Their theories represented not only a substantial improvement over their rivals, but to this day form the foundation for the economist who wishes to successfully analyze money. So that's the explanation of the regression theory and how it applies to Bitcoin. You have to remember that the criticism of Bitcoin by these economists is going to be that there's no way to regress it like you can with gold. There's The argument is implied here that there was a point when gold was traded as a commodity and that at some point in time it was recognized as a superior form of money and it changed from being a commodity into money and uh, the problem with Bitcoin is there's no way to regress it. Now I wanted to show you this type of thinking in terms of political philosophy because actually these sorts of experiments, thought experiments, we'll call them, had been around much longer than the economists had done. And uh, as someone who's a major in philosophy, studied philosophy, uh, you'd know uh, we studied for many, many years 
the great philosophers and the first one of course is going to be Descartes now Rene Descartes was a French philosopher mathematician writer who spent most of his life life in the Dutch Republic he has been dubbed the father of modern philosophy and much subsequent Western philosophy is a response to his writing so this guy is a monster as far as philosophy goes now it's very similar that what the regression theorem is doing it was done a long time ago by Descartes and his primary work was the type of regression theory let's go into this a little bit Descartes is often regarded as the first thinker to emphasize the use of reason to develop the natural sciences for him the philosophy was a thinking system that embodied all knowledge and then he goes into metaphysics being the root in his discourse on the method he attempts to arrive at a fundamental set of principles that one can know as true without any doubt to achieve this he employs a method called hyperbolical metaphysical doubt also sometimes referred to as methodological skepticism he rejects any ideas that can be doubted and then reestablishes them in order to acquire a firm foundation for genuine knowledge initially Descartes arrives at only a single principle thought exists thought cannot be separated from me therefore I exist discourse on the method and principles of philosophy most famously this is known as cogito ergo sum English I think therefore I am therefore Descartes concluded if he doubted then something or someone must be doing the doubting therefore the very fact that he doubted proved his existence now we go on from there and a lot as it said a lot of the philosophers that came uh, down the line after Descartes were basically a response to him and uh, he was a incredible mathematician it's not surprising that he had a basis in mathematics to try to come up with a basis for philosophy now we're gonna jump to the social contract and it's important to understand that in the history of the United States we have this difference between two of the main thinkers there are many many thinkers on the social contract but the two big ones for our purposes are going to be Thomas Hobbes and John Locke now Hobbes wrote a book called Leviathan and Leviathan is very very similar in its attempt to trace back a theoretical foundation for political rule and uh, Hobbes begins with a theory of man and man begins in a state of nature Hobbes calls the state of nature an anarchic condition and it is a war of all against all even when two men are not fighting there's no guarantee that the other will not try to kill him for his property or just out of an aggrieved sense of honor so they must constantly be on guard against one another it is even reasonable to preemptively attack one's neighbor in such a condition there's no place for industry because the fruit thereof is uncertain and consequently not culture of the earth no navigation nor the use of commodities that may be imported by sea no commodious building no instruments of moving and removing such things as require much force no knowledge of the face of the earth no account of time no arts no letters no society and which is worst of all continual fear and danger of violent death and the life of man is and this is the famous quote from Hobbes the life of man under the state of nature is solitary poor nasty brutish and short and uh, Hobbes follows this line of thinking to where he concludes that the only result must be that men must come together to exit the state of nature and there must be a sovereign so for Hobbes the rights of man derive 
from the logical derivation of man's exit from the state of nature and therefore the sovereign is unquestionable the, the the sovereign is an ultimate authority whether it's monarchical or parliamentary so here we have now the difference between Thomas Hobbes and John Locke Thomas Hobbes and the others here Rousseau and Kant are among the most prominent 17th and 18th century theorists of social contract and natural rights each solved the problem of political authority in a different way Grotius posited that the individual human beings had natural rights. Hobbes asserted that humans consent to abdicate their rights in favor of the absolute authority of government, whether monarchical or parliamentary. Now, on the other hand, we have Locke. Locke believed that natural rights were inalienable and that the rule of God, therefore, superseded government authority. And Rousseau believed that democracy, self-rule, was the best way of ensuring the general welfare while maintaining individual freedom under the rule of law. The Lockean concept of the social contract was invoked in the United States Declaration of Independence. Social contract theories were eclipsed, etc. So, this is a very important distinction to understand. Hobbes is a type of regression theory this was not something that was chosen by the framers of the Constitution. The framers of the Constitution cited Locke's belief in natural rights, which are derived from God, and that is how we ended up with the Declaration of Independence. Now, how does this apply to what we're talking about? It's my opinion that the von Mises regression theory is a Hobbesian type of thought experiment of course which began with Descartes it doesn't really tell you a lot about what really happened and you'll find that these people aren't really very interested in history they're more interested in their thought experiments and of course in my opinion that's why these things are invalid because we know when we look at history that gold is money we don't really need to look and try to find out when gold became money to understand why gold is money all we have to do is look at gold and understand all of its properties it's quite clear why gold was chosen over anything else similarly to understand the value of Bitcoin to begin with we really only need to look at the price and the price will tell you how many people are finding this value of all of the elements that are that make up what is money are contained in Bitcoin so Bitcoin has already emerged we don't really need to do some type of historical regression or try to argue that it's invalid based on some theoretical regression just like we don't need to try to understand why we have rights based on some theoretical regression when we all or if we agree with the Constitution the Declaration of Independence understand that we have inalienable rights and uh, those can't be violated by a sovereign regardless of what type of theory is the basis of that sovereign's right to rule so Bitcoin is already money we don't need to do any type of regression and in the same way that gold is already money in every historical period that we can look back upon to find gold it's already operating as money the regression theory is just a thought experiment it doesn't have a lot to do with reality and the fact is we're already in the new reality where Bitcoin has emerged as money and it's not going to go away regardless of how many arguments the von Mises school makes against it and we'll talk to you next time